What you need is a subspecialist in alienation and estrangement who sees it all the time, not the best psychologist in the world who rarely sees it. And so very briefly, the short answer to this question, how does this happen, is this field is highly counterintuitive to anyone who doesn't have extensive training and experience dealing with it. They, most people will usually get it wrong. And when I say people, I mean attorneys, psychologists, other mental health experts. The mo majority of the time, they will not only get the case and the evaluation and the recommendations wrong, they will get it exactly backwards. First of all, and think how counterintuitive this is, in an alienation setting, most children will align with the abusive parent. It's like, a, a, you know, these kids that you find that have been living with their abductors for years and then they resist capture or st Stockholm Syndrome. Very counterintuitive. Number two, what we would call pathological enmeshment, and I'll define that briefly. It means that the alienating parent has an unhealthy enmeshment with the child to the point where the child has lost his or her individuality. A severe erosion of critical reasoning skills, uh, boundary violations, sleeping with the other parent, or at least doing the bidding of the other parent, inappropriate sharing of information, which all the lawyers have heard of. Pathological enmeshment is a very serious psychiatric problem. And to a non-expert, it looks exactly like a warm, close, loving, healthy relationship. The non-expert comes in with perhaps a PhD or an MD in psychiatry or psychology, and what they see is the, let's just say mother and father for simplicity, but it's about a 50-50 spread of who does what these days. You know, the, the two little girls are tightly bound to the mother, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. They look at dad and say, I don't want to see him, he's a bad man, she's perfect, he's rotten. The non-expert says, wow, look at that great relationship. They really don't know how to probe to see if we have, there are three types of pathological enmeshment, infantilization, adultification, making them little adults. Why don't you decide if you want to see that? Right there, that's adultification. Right there, that's pathological enmeshment. So I repeat, pathological enmeshment to a non-subspecialist, to an experienced forensic psychiatrist, looks just like a warm, healthy relationship. The fundamental attribution error means you look at behavior and you think it's, if you see an angry man, someone who's angry, you say, he's an angry man. You think it's his character. In general, he's an angry man. Never mind that the reason he's angry is someone just stole his car or his wallet. Uh, you, you were hardwired to say, oh, I'm going to stay away from that guy. He's displaying anger. So if the anger is situational, then it's an error. Now, the relevance to us is that when an interviewer sees a severe case of alienation, the alienating parent is cool, calm, and collected. He or she is probably a borderline, a sociopath, or a narcissist, or all three, and is a master manipulator, has learned to convincingly mimic normal behavior, and presents very well. Oh, yes, I encourage the child's relationship with his father or his mother. Um, by contrast, the targeted parent has PTSD, has not seen the child in God knows how long, maybe years, has been told that he's the one who's the problem or she's the one, and comes in all intense, all angry, and all stressed out. Now, I personally sat through a whole course at an AFCC meeting where the t person teaching the course said to the people in the group, you can go by what you see. If the Parent presents anxious and intense, you can be sure that's how they parent. No, that's an elementary error in clinical reasoning and decision making. Not if it's a fundamental attribution error. The severe cases are fundamentally different than moderate cases. In a moderate case, 
it is very reasonable to try to educate the parent to be more cooperative. But in a severe case where you have what one expert's called uh, an obsessed alienator, that person with almost 100% certainty has a severe personality disorder. Normal people just don't do that to their children. And one clue would be that they block access for years on end for trivial, frivolous reasons that you would never block access to your children for. Um, another uh, indica indication or indicator would be the repeated breaching of court orders, which again, a normal person would never do. So just to give you a glimpse of the pattern, when you see excuses like they, they don't like him, they don't want to see him, and I'm not going to force them, you should sit bolt upright in your chair. Normal psychotherapy makes these cases worse. So if it's a skilled psychotherapist who thinks you can come in and do di dyadic therapy, well, why don't you find something to apologize for? Johnny, how did that make you feel? That's a disaster. Don't try that, even with a medium case they will almost always get catastrophically worse. So you have to match the therapist with the kid. That's my answer. There are two places one in Canada run by Kathleen Ray, another in Texas run by Richard Warshak. Give them four days with the kid and the kid returns to the rejected parent happy as a clam to be reunited. But they require a change in custody and no contact with the alienating parent for 90 days. Other than that, there is no hope for a severe case. Don't even think of doing it with orifice therapy.